Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on logic, philosophy, and my favorite philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein. So please see my other talks on Wittgenstein, and I was just leaving off on language as an old city, and that there are suburbs of more modern forms, which may be more kind of rigid, more grid-like, like Salt Lake City, as I was saying, then can grow around, again, Salt Lake City is a little different because it's actually a grid and then there's actually suburbs around the grid. But that's a very recent city built very square-like around the temple um, in the middle, uh, the tabernacle, etc., and the choir. So uh, with all that, to continue on our tune here, let's continue on with the philosophical investigations. This is a part two of the same talk. So, the forms of life we live, including the language games we play, are not set in permanent stone. There is no fixed number of ways of using language or thought, with new ways being added and others forgotten. Just as we see in the history of mathematics and the sciences. Keep in mind, for Lewis Carroll there were no negative numbers because that would have resulted in impossible imaginary numbers, and now there are officially imaginary numbers in mathematics. And for just this reason, many people speak after Gödel of a plurality of maths, but that is still, of course, wonderful and controversial and all of that. We can use a picture of a boxer, Wittgenstein says, to do many different things. And this is how we can use words and language. So we could use the picture of the boxer to show how, someone how to stand as a boxer, how not to stand as a good or a bad example. One of the things going on in here is Wittgenstein definitely suggests we could always have a form of life as long as we have good and bad examples. As long as there's goods that we include and bads we exclude, which of course calls up all sorts of social questions, doesn't it? That can be a form of life. It just needs to have ways that more than one person can validate there's ins and outs. It's almost like Carl Schmitt says of the concept of the state, is that as long as there's goods and bads that people can point to, children can learn the game. Something like that is the basis for a form of life. And it doesn't have to be just a totally in or out. It doesn't have to be vicious about it. But that as long as you can use positive and negative examples, you could play some kind of game or form of life or live rather than play a game. You could live a form of life with others. So those are you could use it as these two different examples. You could say this is a way the guy once stood. We could argue about whether it's good or bad. It can stand in many different ways as a picture of a guy standing, as a boxer, as someone with good posture, and not even as a boxer, because it turns out I'm telling you boxers stand with good posture like this guy. You could do countless other things as soon as you include posture or anything else. Notice the inner network means there's an infinite amount of simple uh, arrangements. Language and thought give us innumerable tools to use. So just like the tools in the toolbox, you could recombine them in simple ways. We understand, but there's no end to them. That doesn't mean it's beyond our grasp, any of the tools. Each tool can be used in innumerable ways. Now, there's general ways we use words. Otherwise, we would not have tools or words and use them and recognize it. But in combination with situations... We are able to soak up innumerable situations without numbering or quantizing anything, especially if number words are actually a recent development in the human mind and life. And by recent, I mean several thousand years, like maybe eight or so out of a hundred or two hundred thousand. So it is entirely opposite the idea. This is entirely Wittgenstein's perspective. The idea that there are fixed number of forms, atomic forms, like with Russell, that complete logic as a set for Frege, Boole, Russell, that there's a set number of these. Lewis Carroll resists this. Lewis Carroll says we could have any number of symbols for any move and any number of moves for any sort of symbol or type of a thing. So here, in fact, he resisted this kind of uh, closure, which Wittgenstein himself is now trying to open up. Uh, that there are not single universal ways. There are actually general ways that simple things network and we understand and live and practice those and children watch and then are taught and are only told when there's a bad example or a good example they may not recognize a lot of the time. Although it could be any number of things lang for language use other than just pointing out good or bad examples like with the boxer posture, although goods and bads are very basic to forms of life, I believe. But 
Wittgenstein argued in his Tractatus uh, that there is a single universal way that logic operates in mathematical ways, but he clearly turned from this saying, well, that is a very rigid com uh, computer kind of abacus of logic, but that isn't very much like the abacus, abacai, uh, I don't know. But whether or not that, long after the Latin and the Romans, uh, Leibniz was fascinated with abacuses, abacai, uh, and he helped develop the binary computer. So, in a certain sense, fixed binary forms in a computer have a very set deterministic single element and form of information. But with the human uh, life, mind, body, and mind together, forms of life and verbalized debate or argument or information that is being asserted or denied an argument, which would be logic. And it would have to be trying to change the situation. Otherwise, why would I just assert things about the situation? That an act of human logic and meaning would itself have to be interwoven from a simple, uh, simple, but to us simple, but also diverse, not simply monolithic number of elements. And we wouldn't have to quantize them. You wouldn't really have to know there's 14 ingredients for a cake. You just make the cake by adding and subtracting. You don't count to 14 through the course. And, and then if you add one, does that skip you up? No. Adding a bit of cinnamon shouldn't uh, screw up the count. Or at least that's things are usually not counted that way ex uh, for any purpose. And it would be weird and need purpose to justify it. So the way we use words to directly refer to particular things, the most simple and drawer-like way, this is what Wittgenstein describes in the Augustine then shop. I almost want to think that this is Lewis Carroll, somewhat of the shop of the sheep inspired, but they're so different uh, other than being set in a shop that I won't draw that particular parallel at all. I have still videos to make very particularly about the parallels between Carroll and Wittgenstein. I am referring to Carroll a decent amount because I've been doing him a decent amount, but I'm going to make particular videos about how Carroll and Wittgenstein are similar because it's remarkable. As George Pitcher uh, wrote an article about in 1965 that I have found, and I've found little else on the topic, which is quite extraordinary, but I'll get to that later. So... When we do use language in a drawer-like way, where there is just one thing for one particular thing, and there's not various ways it could be internetworked in the situation, as if there's a drawer for five apples, and you go to the store, you say, give me the five apples, and they go to the five apples drawer, and they pull out the five apples from the five apples drawer, rather than it being a variable number of apples, and it could be a type of apples, probably. Those sorts of generalities and reasoning problems are normal to life. So we don't just walk up to the store and push a button on a vending machine and now we're done, which seems to be more the way that a completely uh, single basement element logic, which is entirely information and entirely certain and fact, proceeding from fact A to fact B to fact C, would proceed in the world as if we know we get five apples now, yes, we get five apples now, we're done. Much works much like that, but notice that in life there's problems, we have mechanisms, we have behaviors, we have practices, and it's all clear enough to live, but also multivalent and open and interactive. So if we point it to uh, what Wittgenstein argues, though, is that even if we used language in this drawer-like simple way, it could be interpreted in various ways, which is what Carroll and others would argue. If we point to two apples and use the word zorp, this could mean apples, or uh, it could mean apple, or apples, two, red, round, on the table, ready to eat, or any number of things. So if you, and now a child would not know that, but a child would know if you start using the word zorp around apples, but not around pears and not around red things, the child soaks this up and learns this without a paragraph or a long set of data that explains exactly what qualifies as an apple. So by association, um, uh, paradigms, etc., the child learns through behavior to figure out what an apple is, and also notice, learns zorp means apple not round or red. Now that's the kind of thing where, because Wittgenstein is pointing this out, you can see how if you're following along with the description I'm giving of language and, and behavior, this creates a necessarily Wittgensteinian problem for trying to iron out what an apple means in a single element. Because not only have I specifically, unlike Wittgenstein, gone through the trouble of making sure that we go through the senses and other things first, and then so an apple is a mixture of sensations into being a uh, physical apple. 
So we already have problems very similarly from the get-go with sensation in the child before language use, that now that you have language use, and Zorp means apple in our culture here uh, that we're making up out of the fly, on the fly, but it doesn't mean red around. Well, now Zorp means apple in several different situations, and it has to be overlapping over several practices, and now you have a multiva uh, multivalent diverse interactive thing. In order to have apple as opposed to round or red, I can't just go for red things when they're always apples. I now have to have a word which is open-ended because it is involved in multiple practices with apples. Yes, with Zorp etc. Gesundheit. So yes, with all of that, it actually shows you, it isn't a perfect argument from this direction, I must admit, but then again, uh, Wittgenstein did not feel that he was giving an airtight, perfect argument here. It is pointing us in the direction that even when we have something drawer-like and we say, that's an apple, I have a set concept for that. The problem is, is that the way that a child learns that an apple does not refer to the red things or the round things, and then we could start referring to round things as apples any time and learn that practice together, which comes next socially. The problem is, is that we've already got something that has to be defined by use over ver varied situations that may not contain one bedrock element other than also involving apples, yes, and see, now we've opened up the situation for endless problems, but if we understand it's enough of a circulation of life to create the word apple for the child and following the adults... We already have the unstable, because apples could disappear, but sufficient form of life for meaning and the word and the practice without the need of pages and pages of definition for what an apple is, which is how the child learns the word. So if we say by Zorp, I mean the number, we would then have to define number. If we explained this, and here again, if we explain with pages we hand to the child, well, we're getting to what Apple means. How do I explain to the child what all the, da what all the pages of paragraphs mean if I can't get to Apple first? We're really going around the rosy with that, aren't we? So we would have to define number by pointing at other things. And again, there's no final definition of the chain here, which you can see because it's, if it's an ecosystem of apples and numbers and eyes and carts, then we're co-defining things by everything having its practices, and then verbal practices are part of those practices. That is the Wittgensteinian situation that explains what's going on with truth and meaning, and we're leaving a lot out there about all these practices. But the way of un the the idea, and the reason that I'm arguing this this way is because there isn't actually a full-ordered objective bedrock level of information going on as much as there are simple things interwoven across varied situations that allow Zorp or Apple to be a word applied and used in various ways, which is the only way words can be used, even words like Apple, because they can't just go in one practice of store Apple buying. So in that sense... Again, language use would look very different. Let's just say language use in us and children would look very different if it were that way. We would look much more limited than we are. And again, as Wittgenstein says, you could do philosophy entirely in jokes, and we could not joke at all if we did not have uh, confusions like this, which is why I think Wittgenstein says, and Alice in Wonderland is very much Aristotelian philosophy in jokes, if you ask me, and go with my theories. So in a certain sense, Carol is doing philosophy very much in fiction and jokes and humor by doing verbal puns, because verbal puns and jokes show you the, it feels funny here, why does it not fit? And that's when we misuse things like Apple and Zorp. The very fact I'm using the word Zorp for Apple feels funny, doesn't it? Because we don't use the word Zorp, which is a nonsense word that sounds silly to the English user for me. Zorp means it could be familiar in another language. It's not a familiar word in English, and so therefore it's a nonsense word in English I am intentionally using. And I can do that with a word, which is weird. In fact, since I invented the word Zorp, it is good to move on, um, and I will do special a special section on Lewis Carroll, uh, and more than one video on Lewis Carroll and Wittgenstein. But we are going to be moving here to Boo 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 and Humpty Dumpty here in a second. So, as we're getting there, just as children can learn chess by watching without ever hearing about rules and words, which is very much how chess and soccer are not really rule-based, but practice-based and very regular activities, although the word regular actually is just more syllables for rule, king, uh, queen, royal, ruled, reg, gina, oh, regina. 
Children learn language by watching, listening, and then participating, not reading rule books, without ever hearing about the rules of grammar or the rules of when to apply a particular word. Thus, if a child is familiar with chess, they could learn what the ch queen piece is and what it does before learning to call it the queen. We could see that, again, in a child most likely de developing language use, that they actually can point, of course, do not know the word, which we could only know if the child is learning language, because, of course, if they don't or do know the language, it would not work. But if they start to identify the queen and do not know the word queen and then do, that would be the situation that would show us that. Unlike Freud and Piaget, I do not have my own children presently uh, to experiment on, but or observe at least, you know, not trying to put it terribly. So while we can use words in many different ways and invent new ways to use them, we typically use them in ways we share with others because language would not work as it does without familiar practices and routines. We cannot say, and this is the part which is very uh, brilliant, br uh, brillig, brilliant, of Humpty Dumpty, and many people have remarked the part of Lewis Carroll that stands out the most as far as a clear parallel and possible influence on Wittgenstein, other than the two footnotes in the Philosophical Investigations that say see Lewis Carroll by name. Well, one says Lewis Carroll, the other one is clear reference to the backwards writing of the Looking Glass, that Humpty Dumpty in the Looking Glass the second of the Alice Adventures, says, brilliant, that's a nice, uh, and when I say that, I mean that's a nice knockdown argument, and whenever I can make words mean whatever I want them to mean. <coughs> Excuse me. But he tells Al he keeps correcting Alice, and he acts like Alice isn't using the right words she intends to mean, much like the Mad Tea Party. So, with all of that, he, Wittgenstein says, and it sounds like he means something like, if he's not thinking of, something very similar to, and I think he is thinking partly of, Humpty Dumpty. Why is it that Humpty Dumpty, or we, cannot say boo 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 and force it to mean right now, as I'm saying it, if it doesn't rain, I'll go out for a walk? Why can't we do that? Now, of course, what you can do, I think Wittgenstein would say, and it's a very interesting way of arguing. In fact, there's many Wittgensteinian points like this that I really like, which really leave you kind of zen-like mystified, as if where is the true thing here? Because when you actually destroy the situation by rewording it, you don't actually create the natural situation you would be in which boo-boo-boo-boo turns into meaning for a tribe or a group. If it doesn't rain, I'll go out for a walk. Wittgenstein similarly says, I don't think I have in these notes, which is hilarious. It would be very strange, and it is, and it's interrelated here, to mean for Zorp, and I don't think he says Zorp, but that's my nonsense word, to mean if the 15, if the 515 train from Detroit comes 10 minutes late, I'm going to have to take the train to Pittsburgh. He doesn't say anything of that, but he says it almost like that, effectively. It would be weird. Why? Because, and this is the easiest answer, but it's quite amazing, I, if I walk to the door right now, and if I scream out, boo 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 I can't force it to mean to myself and others the way it naturally, quotey, quotey fingers, does if it arises in a cultural practice with at least me and one other person. Here's one of the most brilliant, interesting things here. If there's two people, an expression can arise and become a special thing between two people. Why is it Leonardo da Vinci wrote backwards but didn't invent his own words? This is very heavily associated with, with what is called either the impossibility of or the private language argument. The impossibility of private language or what? Wittgenstein does not argue that it is impossible for us to come up with our own words individually. But here's an interesting thing. Why don't we come up with our own private words for our own kinds of anger and feel them and then talk to ourselves about it? Why do we talk to ourselves? We Vygotsky says we may flash images to go through thought quicker than saying all the words out, and I think that that is an interwoven Wittgensteinian view. Why is it that we don't name types of red or anger in private ways for our own individual selves and never show them to anyone? There's a bit of a beetle in a box for Wittgenstein here as well. Well, the reason is is that uh, I have a uh, I have a sibling. If I talked back and forth with my sister and said, "Oh, boo 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 boo," we could 
make that mean if it doesn't rain, I'll go for a walk. If we tried, because it would be weird to try, but you could with two people if you got into the regular habit and you thought it was funny. We, let's say we both thought it was funny. We decided to do that. In a, in a little while, it would be something that would mean something. In fact, it could within five minutes. But the interesting thing is it's interwoven with more than one person of a practice. That's what I think is the trick here. When there's more than one participant, the language takes and interweaves as a social practice that an individual cannot say it. I say scream it to emphasize the point. It doesn't matter how much you shut your eyes and try really hard or scream it really loud, does it, Alice? Boo 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 does not socially intertwine with another person encouraging you. It also, Wittgenstein suggests, very much like, and this is also associated with Alice, why can't you put your hand on top of your head and know how tall you're growing? The absurdity of that is very similar. That's found in Alice in Wonderland, too, where she's growing and she's putting her hand on her own head. If you are your own standard, if boo 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 is your own word, if you forget what it means, you can't interweave with others who reinforce the pattern. So it's not impossible to have private language. It would just be extremely impractical and we do not see it happening. As self-centered as human beings are often accused of being the whole species of us and as individuals. Yes? We don't invent our own private language, say it to people, oh, my words to myself just meant more than yours. It would be very weird, but of course, why would we say that to anyone? But why don't we invent private lexicons? Why do we use public words for private talk and thinking to ourselves, along with images, uh, imagination, everything? Well, again, we could get familiar with saying boo-boo, boo-boo as a regular practice, but saying only once lacks signific significance, and it is like your... Re li <laughs> Wittgenstein says, this is another point of Wonderland. Alice says, oh, I'm going to send gifts to my feet. Wittgenstein says, why can't my hand, uh, right hand give my left hand money? I may have already mentioned this in the talks. It doesn't have the same effect. Notice the similarity. Giving one hand something to the other hand is very similar to saying something to yourself and not having another person. Because a hand is actually one person, not two people. If I hand it to your left hand, that's two people. If I hand it to my left hand, that's not two people. It's the same with boo-boo-boo-boo boo, 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 between two siblings or two friends and one person alone trying to do a Wittgensteinian thought experiment by themselves or uh, experiment in their life. They can force it to mean that. It just doesn't take very well because we are such social fitting creatures. We really want there to be practices in which, notice I said good and bad examples. We don't have other people to use the expression poorly or well. What, how do we know it means, like I said, it would be weird to say the Detroit train is late, I'm going to take the train to Pittsburgh is Zorp. There'd have to be extraordinary number of circumstances that would happen and times when I have to say that to you very quickly before I run out of the room or or any number of overlapping practices. Yes, this is the th thinking experiments. So this is our open lab with no cost of lab materials here. So we can't, uh, we really don't interweave as a cultural practice if we can't have goods and bads and we cannot have goods and bads if we cannot have examples of others talking it out with us and saying, no, 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 you meant if it doesn't rain, I'll go for a walk. You said it wrong. Notice there's sort of many parts there. And if somebody isn't there to back up the many parts of it, how are you going to know what boo-boo-boo-boo means? Why doesn't it bleed over into meaning, hey, it's raining or it's not raining? Well, again, these words and the practices don't stabilize without multiple people saying it and diverse elements involved in the individual saying it whenever they do. Along with using things with their eyes, their memory, like Vygotsky says, thinking of visual images, audi audible talking to yourself and the voices of others in your head, which is, of course, very huge uh, for inner focus. So Humpty Dumpty tells Alice in Through the Looking Glass that when he uses a word, it means just what he wants it to. But Humpty is an immature egg. He's an idiot. He's a talented egg. That's what we're shown. He's very good at coming up with explanations on the fly. I think it is Carol mocking a bit himself and others, academics, of course. He's very bright, but he's actually still an egg and immature and doesn't know that it's not so one-sided his way. He doesn't seem aware, Humpty Dumpty doesn't, that language is a shared practice in which neither the sender nor receiver has a complete has complete control, neither do I of my tongue, or the final word on how the situation is interpreted. Rather than search the for the essential and universal form of all language, putting faith in a final authority that will settle all disputes in this or that area of our lives, we should, regardless of theology, law, and all these practices that we're talking about, 
Because we have to look at power on the capillary level, as Foucault said, we should investigate the interrelated variety of ways language and power, for Foucault, work between participants, which is very much, uh, Wittgenstein focuses on language, Foucault on power, but that it's a diverse ecosystem of elements and relationships, of simples, but of course anything gets hairy and complex as soon as you start to try to describe it fully, because how could you? Wittgenstein repeatedly used the term language games and forms of life to describe what he later found fundamental. Now again, language games are actually verbal forms of life, and then games is a term he uses, but he also, of course, does know that there's serious forms of life, and then games does make it sound like we're just playing games without, you know, for language games, language forms, forms of life, verbal forms of life is logicking, reasoning, a lot of it. But of course, it involves all sorts of things, and then we use words a lot with it. So game, this is, is opposed to the ideal Kantian logic he saw it in his earlier work and in the work of Frege and Russell, and then working with, uh, trying to extend their work and working with Russell. Games do not all share one common thing. Also, as games, but and Wittgenstein notes, but board games and card games and ball games are all interrelated in many overlapping ways. Notice they're solitaire. You don't have to beat somebody, although there often is that in games. There could be four or five people to a team or not. There could be game pieces or not. Sometimes there are multiple players or winners or losers, but not always. Often, notice, there actually is winning or losing at solitaire, good and bad. There are a lot of times goods and bads. But at the same time, that doesn't tell you what kinds of goods and bads games have, or if they're goals, or what if there are no points, or what if everybody wins, you know? Very much the Dodos game for Alice. Which is not, if everybody wins and who, who knows, then that's not much of a game, is it? Because there aren't much, uh, in the circling of the practice, there isn't much meaningful winning and losing. Games do not need to be perfect to be playable. This is also, notice how much gray area there is in life. And we don't fully talk it out at all. Our ways and practices rest on unspoken assumptions and expectations. We only try to describe what our presumptions and expectations are when we suppose that someone else doesn't share them and needs to. There's a lot in Wittgenstein that describes that. And then it really is, who knows, well, unfortunately, might makes right too often, and we push our weight around. The use of a word, like a move in a game, is not entirely bounded by rules. Not in a single element. It's situations that enable practices, not secret rules. Just as there are no rules, and I love this example that Wittgenstein uses, about how high or hard one can throw the ball when serving in tennis. You may know that in tennis, uh, they toss the ball up and then serve the ball. Well, technically, of course, and I like to think like Venus Williams being like, and just like chuck the, you know, like, and it goes up into the, disappears, you know, into the sun. And it's just like, okay, you know, well, you can do that, you know, and then of course it comes down, amazing serve. Is, you don't, there is, why? Why isn't there up? You threw it three feet too high. The tennis ball ain't. Well, there is just open areas of games. And we could actually imagine somebody, we can easily imagine in soccer. And this is what happens. Uh, somebody, you know, mentioned that this is for the sports, you know, history fan. The rules of football have changed as the game has changed. Now, the game doesn't change uh, so much such that it can be this pastime. People point at it, say it's it's football, American football. But the game changes and the rules change based on the mechanics, based on the drugs, based on the players, based on the famous precedent, based on if somebody makes starts making a move that's amazing, they have to now X that out. So somebody could suddenly, in the world of tennis, make how high you throw the ball an important thing as soon as they invent a cheap move, but that isn't invented yet. So nobody cares. So nobody describes it and nobody does. Notice that kind of gray area is just left open in everything so much. And we don't need to, just like you're not counting the words. How many words did I say? How many adjectives? Did I say more adjectives than adverbs? You don't care. Why would you care? You could. You could go through this talk, this video, and then you could be a psychologist and a, uh, a linguist and figure out which I did, and that's important for my personality type. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know that now. I haven't the concern in the world for it, you know, even as it informs my behavior that way if it does. So here again, how many adverbs I use is very much right as I use them right now, bigly, incorrectly. Adverbs, adjectives, what has you. I was educated somehow. I swears. 
that if you think about how high to serve the tennis, how high to throw the tennis ball on a serve and how that's a gray area, think about how we're just surrounded by gray areas and life goes on because verbalization and rules are actually only a very slight element that are tool used. And like mathematics, according to Gödel, a diverse toolbox. That's Wittgenstein's image, but not a unified. It doesn't need to be a unified Swiss Army knife that's perfect. So descriptions and rules are not complete explanations, but tools we can use for particular problems, just as we can tell someone to hang out in a general area rather than stand in a precisely defined spot. We do not always need to replace blurred pictures with sharper ones or general loose conception of apples with absolutely complete ones, like the tennis serve is left gray and open. A lot of times people seem to suggest things should be more logical and precise in general. No. How many Tuesdays you're going to live doesn't need to be. Or like how you feel a certain day doesn't need to be more logical and precise. That's not how everything in life works. Only things that you need to be more precise for specific purposes need to be more precise. Everything is left open. Otherwise, we could freak out about it. We should not. That would, again, just be some strange whole uh, conniption for no reason. What would a complete understanding of apples be? And why would we need it? I mean, I would need to know exactly where every apple is going to be. I haven't done the logic with uh, Islamic. Uh, I need to do, I only did Farabi. But with Avicenna and Averroes, you definitely see us talking about whether, uh, you see Muslim, the greatest of Islamic philosophers and logicians, considering whether or not it's an idea or an actual group of things to talk about horses. Avicenna says, no, it's really an idea, like your idea of unicorns. Averroes is like, ah, it's more the existing group of things. The very fact we can get into a argument about whether or not horses, I've never met all horses. I'm never going to meet all horses. I haven't seen any horses today. And yet I'm going to talk to you about them. That's insane. But that's okay because you trust me and it feels comfortable, or at least it doesn't feel uncomfortable for me to use the word horse a lot. That's nuts. It's kind of amazing, but think about how my idea of horses is largely what horses are to me. A mentality, we could call it, although really we should put that in quote fingers, because Wittgenstein would say it's not really a mentality. But he would not agree with Averroes, it's just the brute group of horses, because it is something kind of like the sort of idealist, uh, more so, Aver uh, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, is saying. It actually is that horses, to me, is something like a whole experience that isn't physically here as the group of them, and then that can be called a mentality or a concept, but in fact, it is our open-ended experience of how we experience sensation, mind, body, all of it interwoven, and horses and apples and everything are not set fixed concepts inside. They are actually the group of things, but we experience that mentally, physically as the group of things and also our word. In ancient times... A lot of ancient logicians and uh, others would refer to concepts not as a concept, but as the word uh, for something. And again, it is odd and interesting to think what it is to use a word or use a concept and what that is still, and to try to figure it out, which this is some of the better of that that I have found so far with the latter work of Wittgenstein. And that's what I was taught also. So... So when we speak about apples in general, I don't know where all apples are. I don't know how many more apples are going to be in my lives. I'm never going to pretend to count them. I'm never going to uh, take a stab at it. That doesn't make my use of uh, my mentalities and practices towards apples irrational. It does, but no one cares and I don't. They don't need to be more precise or more rational than that. So here it's an odd thing because rational means sort of should have thought it out as best you could. Here my thing is rational enough and that it need be no more rational than this. It's like the tennis serve. We often need concepts and practices that are open to variation, which is how we learn and teach others through general examples that roughly apply but allow for innumerable exceptions. I was mentioning um, uh, to a uh, well to a colleague that you go to the store, you don't go for five apples off it. And that is in beginning Wittgenstein, it definitely he says slab, call for slab, five apples, call for five apples. It would be odd to go to the store for five apples, wouldn't it? Then go for enough apples for two pies, and then it wouldn't be a precise number. You'd have to sort of weigh it or no. In fact, it would more be, uh, it would, and somebody would say, well, it's a quantity of poundage. Okay, that is, of course, we have uh, weights and scales and things. It, of course, would be, without such practices, somebody would eyeball it and say, well, about these 18, okay, they're smaller. Well, let's have like 22. But you wouldn't need to be 22. You would sort of sight it and try to or weigh it in your arms. It's, again, very interesting and odd with all of this 
to try to say that it should be much more precise than that, or we go to the store to get five apples exactly, and that's rational thought, because that's actually an overestimation of how verbalized and quantitative we are in everyday thinking in ways that are just needless. Uh, because useless, Wittgenstein would say, thus, nonsensical. For nonsense for Wittgenstein in his early period was more logically impossible. In his latter period, I think, and I use this more, I think nonsense is, it just is very useless to say. We can't get anywhere very well that we want to get from there if we talk that way. Or we give examples that way. I guess that would involve talking a lot, often. So we make our understandings more exact in ways, but this can mislead us into thinking, especially in modern society, notice many would gripe, that complete exactness is our actual and achievable goal. And of course, think of beauty image standards, think of modern visual media, think about how people want to physically and mentally be the best or never appear wrong, physically and mentally or wrong about anything. That again is not achievable. Uh, well, it's good to mention, Confucius said in two different passages, but putting them together is there's perfection is nowhere, but everywhere I reach, there's some goodness is immediately at hand. So just as a sign is placed where it will prevent many from going wrong or the wrong way, but it can't prevent all by itself as if it needs to get stronger uh, from every, from everyone going the wrong way. Rules can prevent misunderstandings. That's why they would be used. We don't say anything about the tennis serve. And then once there's problems, we start saying enough and then we're like, well, we don't know what to say right here. They're, we're still having problems or not. Rules like signs can be doubted or interpreted differently. Descriptions, reasons, and rules are useful and can rest on other descriptions, reasons, and rules. But because there can always be further disputes about descriptions, further descriptions could always be useful such that no final description makes further descriptions impossible. Now, what that says in a mouthful is... There technically is, in a certain sense, objective truth. I definitely like arguing about objective and subjective truth. I like Wittgenstein because I think this gives us a perspective about what objective and subjective truth is better than others. And the reason is, is because people think of objective truth as something like a full verbal description in English or another language, which would fully describe perfectly the situation. You can actually see with Wittgenstein and the tennis serve and everything I'm leading up to here, fully objective truth in words is impossible. Now, Observation with the senses that is trustable is a lot of the truth. In fact, this is like the Nyaya of India. Most of the truth we have around us is our eyes and ears, and maybe our chattering away in our mind, and it's only somewhat true. Now, if, you will, if we want to, and I have made this argument before and been mistaken by others in bad ways, and I don't mean it that way, I use meaning in a broader way than I use the word truth. Truth is technically something for me that involves, and I think this is because of language use. Truth often involves something like words. Truth is often not meaning as in anything could be meaningful, but truth often is use a word used around truthful words. An apple isn't really true because it's there. Although you could be hallucinating and believe it falsely there. But in a certain sense, if I say that's an apple, those are true words or not. So in a certain sense, truth is about true uh, words sticking true like a sail holds true. In a certain sense, people have talked of correspondence and others like Rorty have mentioned in Pragmatists. Correspondence isn't really a perfect thing. It's kind of a metaphor, the mirror, as Rorty says. I have a talk all on that. But here, what we actually just said, and I won't get into it anymore, a full description of objective reality, uh, objective truth in words, is like repairing a torn spider's web with our fingers. We, our life is so rich and diverse. It would be impossible for me to explain what I see with my eyes right now entirely in English. Much of truth, if we want to say what I see with my eyes is true, sure. But technically, again, if we mean something like objective data and descriptions, Thinking about the tennis serve and everything I'm, we're talking about, that's just completely gone. And in fact, that gives us the richness of life, even though we can, and we should, represent life, of course, in games and systems. And I hope to be more involved with all of that. That with all of that, much of that would not be verbal paragraphs of information right in front of the player. It would have to be diverse audio, audio visuals, it would be several things mixed together that is not simply a verbal description. Even though computers are, in a certain sense, Wittgenstein, I think, would say, unlike the brain, representing, although unconsciously, many would say, I would, 
uh, a bunch of things in a single element of data and uh, and programming and switches, but those aren't really communication back and forth with each other the ways that human communication and debate and logic happen. Because a computer does not have to argue with itself passionately to motivate itself to do anything or get itself, uh, you know, get itself out of a funk and then feel, eh, I'm all right with this. That is a very different process for a computer, but that is human logical reasoning to reason in and out of emotions, states, wants, desires, needs, unlike a computer but let's go on here with this again there's so much interwoven here and so much to go off on that i end up getting on tangents and we've already gotten 40 minutes in and i've only gotten a couple i got a couple more paragraphs to finish off here and let's make it a 45 minute second part talk here and we have wittgenstein's blackboard wittgenstein and the child at the blackboard it is very interesting to think but if you picture a child at a blackboard we now have like whiteboards, yes, and markers, multicolored. That if we, if the child is learning math, it's very easy to think that the child is learning the symbols on the board. But actually what this picture suggests, and much of what I was ranting about just now, the part that's focused in the symbols requires the classroom, requires the students to trust the teacher. It requires all sorts of elements you can ignore just to look at the symbols, but the symbols can't operate themselves. I do mention to the students, when I have a classroom, you all had to walk in here. I just started talking. I didn't prove to you I have credentials. People start listening. That's because we're all brainwashed sheep and you walk into a classroom. Nobody tries to take me out with a tackle. Well, then I get to talk and everybody thinks I'm the teacher. That's because we're programmed, man. Well, in a certain sense, the child is already programmed to approach a blackboard by the time the child approaches the blackboard to learn algebra. So then... If you miss out on the fact, and it is, some may say negligible, but here the, the strong denial is without trust in a teacher, algebraic symbols don't get led and interwoven into anything and then used for any purposes at the grocery store or not for anything we would or wouldn't desire. It seems like you could ignore, ah, there's emotion, there's people, there's apples. We can ignore all that and just look at the algebra as abstractions. But that's very much the Aristotle versus Carroll versus Boole versus Wittgenstein thing. The thing is, is that the child at the blackboard, what Wittgenstein says, and it's a very vertigo-inducing moment, it seems like the rules of the math are right there. But actually, the rule is the child being conditioned into the form of the classroom and the symbols all at once as a form of life. Using algebraic symbols requires a form of learning math classes. Learning math classes requires lunch. It requires children. It requires air in the classroom. You could say the air is negligible. That does not mean anything here could do without it or altering the air in the classroom wouldn't have any effect on the math or how many mistakes were made. Yeah, arithmetic, actually, that's a good one also. I had not thought of that until now. Many would say arithmetic simply operates like in a vacuum. Well, if you started draining the air from the classroom, people would make more and more mistakes with arithmetic. If you dimmed the lights, people would make more and more mistakes with basic numbers. No, there in a certain sense is not pure situations of pure quantity that are purely sensed or purely grasped with mind or hand or body or eyes or what have you. It's actually not a real thing, but we can just not talk about elements of it. And then we have the pure rules of algebra. In a weird way, what I am saying, essentially, there are no pure rules of algebra without trusting children and adults and emotions, which is weird. And it may seem negligible, but it actually has to do with how math is not a unified practice for Gödel and how logic is not a unified practice for Wittgenstein. Here, this has nothing to do with whether or not we can be more successful at debate and logic in particular applied circumstances. This is the larger clearing of ground. And then in particular practices, we could be more or less logical or aware of elements coming in and out. Yes. So, yes. So Wittgenstein knows this because his earlier truth table logic was supposed to be the final grounding set of rules for math mathematics as well as philosophy and logical human thought or the foundation for positivism sought by Russell. So here we have Wittgenstein's thread. The thread, uh, Confucius said actually that there is one thread running through the whole of my teaching, which is compassion. Now, Wittgenstein actually says, oddly, and I often screw this up and think a thread and a rope, the strength of a thread is not found in a single fiber that runs the whole length, Wittgenstein says, but in the interweaving of many fibers. 
Just as the many members of a family resemble each other in many overlapping ways rather than sharing one thing together in common, the ways we use language, games, and other things form families that do not have universal underlying forms. Think about how family overlaps and live and die and then continue all together. Have to do that. Think about how you don't always feel love, you don't always feel happiness, but you feel them enough and they're interwoven with your life. Think about how Freud tried to boil everything down to sex, but with the Wittgenstein's oven, how sex is very dominant a form in life, but not always as a thread, always through the whole of one's life or conscious awareness, etc. In that sense, everything is not at base sexual or at base logical or at base illogical or at base visual or at base audible or at base language games or at base anything. We are, of course, loosely using the term forms of life to mean kind of everything that exists. But, of course, forms of life here, then, other than that, is simply whatever practices there are. And, in fact, we're not even saying human practices. So here are any living cultures of organisms. So that would be forms of life, and that's so open-minded that that actually shows we're caring about life rather than the dead, um, but or, like, inorganic. But that itself, of course, is a certain sense privileging things with language because of course we need rocks and minerals and dead things in order to live so and you need air that has living things in it and isn't perfectly living i imagine so you need the dead and the living in order to live so with all of that interwoven so here we have where the color red lives and i do like this idea in particular as well while it seems that the color red itself, in a certain sense, can't be destroyed, or that you have a concept of red, I do enjoy trying to remove people's concept of apples and say, well, what does it start with, or how many parts does it have? Where is the color red in your life? Well, in a certain sense, as Wittgenstein gets to it, red is actually an interweaving of us, seeing it in the world as children, seeing it in the mind, imagining it whenever we need to. It's a certain range of colors, and we don't have it entirely defined, but it's pointed out to us. For a while, orange was a uh, yellowish red, and then it became separate as orange. So in a certain sense, red isn't in culture, it isn't in the mind, it isn't in the world, it is in the networking of all of these together. Now, there are some, of course, who would try to give a hard argument, well, red is these retina, you know, part of the eye, Sure, but what we call red versus orange actually has to be the inner networking of eyes, lives, cultures, tongues, words, practices, air, to speak through the mouth, etc. And again, you can ignore it at your peril, but the problem is, is that people, and we've been doing the history of logic in this class, in the logic class, and for history of philosophy, for the philosophy, uh, modern philosophy class, here, in fact, again, there may there need be no one set thing. Now, again, it is set enough and seeing red enough in the world, but then again, what that is has to be internet with worked with other things, just like what an apple is. Thinking is a similar interweaving. To fully describe it, again, as Wittgenstein said, would be like repairing a torn spider's web with our fingers. So, like red, thinking is an interweaving of different elements such as feelings, images, and words, and it need not be grounded in one or more than another in, in one or more than another in any particular thought. Or any better words I say. When we ask ourselves what reason we have to fear that fire will hurt our hand or expect a table will resist our touch, Wittgenstein says innumerable reasons drown each other out as we've had innumerable experiences. Now, he says this, and I actually have a critical thought here. If he does mean a bunch of voices, he actually does say something like a tons of voices cry out. That is a little bit metaphorical of him because they're not actually tons and tons of voices saying no. Perhaps you hear voices saying no, but you need not always, but a bunch interweaves of your experience. And it need not merely be vocal to tell you no. And then you could either interweave further or not and think further or not about it. And quite quickly too, especially when it comes to flame and tying all that together and avoiding it or not. So the more we seek an ideal universal logic or rules in how we speak, think, and act, the farther we are from finding good footing in our world, as if trying to walk on slippery ice without a hint of friction. In order to take significant steps forward in understanding the forms of life we live, Wittgenstein argues we must turn away from the crystal clear ideal world of timeless ghosts that view things from nowhere in particular, and return to the rough ground of actual existence where things can always be slightly more complicated, and we can always be quite misinformed in this or that space and at this or that time. Yastro's duck rabbit, a, pop a popular optical illusion, can be seen either as a rabbit's head looking to the right or a duck's head looking to the left. 
It was an image that Wittgenstein was pondering, and he calls it Yastrov, uh, Duck Rabbit, it Yastrov, perhaps, um, as he wrote it in his final notes. And we and it is I actually heard it described in a psychology textbook I had as a teenager as Wittgenstein's Duck Rabbit, and that was actually the first time I heard the name Wittgenstein. Probably read it and may or may not have heard it mispronounced, much as I do or don't. So we could look, uh, Wittgenstein actually has many notes about this that aren't in the philosophical investigations. And in another of his notebooks, he actually says we could look at the same head surrounded by rabbits on one page, look at the same head as surrounded by ducks on another page, and we may not notice they're one and the same figure because of context, because of situation. In fact, the word context is simply a fancy word, although situation is more syllables for what's happening and the things around us as they are right then. So, because there is no contextless truth, meaning life, form, anything. So there is situated meaning truth. We need always, we need never say context or situation because it's always there. It's just, these are also useful words for pointing at the uh, interweaving of things. And in the interweaving of things, we may not recognize the same thing twice, of course. We are that sort of organism. And in fact, I think what Wittgenstein would say is it's good that we can use or in multiple ways and not hiccup and think we should use it one way. That probably allows for the variability of human meaning and the vast interweaving of it so quickly as human thought that we all enjoy and not so much when we don't. So in the middle of Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat tells Alice that everyone in Wonderland is mad and illustrates this by comparing cats and dogs, with dogs thinking cats are backwards for wagging their tails when angry and growling when happy. And Alice says she calls it purring, not growling, and the cat says call it whatever you like. Everyone is crazy because people do things in particular ways, and that makes everyone backwards and insane to someone else. And Wittgenstein said something very similar about realists and idealists, and that means something interrelated with objective and subjective truth, although he wouldn't equate those completely. But I think he would think that that is a similar track where people try to find meaning and truth inside like Kant, or they try to find it realist outside, there's just facts in the world as Russell thought. Well, while Wittgenstein was wrestling with how Schopenhauerian and Kantian am I that truth is ideal in the mind and the shape of concepts, more Avicenna, and how much am I a realist and more like a Verowese and Russell out in the world with real cows and real horses as the real facts, and Wittgenstein came to see that realists and idealists who say truth and meaning are facts found in the world and those who say they're ideals constructed in the mind each attack the other's statements as if they are uncompromising universal declarations and defend their own statements as if they are reasonable common sense that allow for exceptions. Buddha says that very much also. In another place where I don't believe that Wittgenstein ever read Buddhism, Buddha, basic Buddhist text, but if he had... He would have recognized the, that is actually, again, very much what the Buddha says. You can observe that in people. People do not argue on even terrain very often, do they? They take the high ground, don't they? Whether or not they are the chosen one. Philosophy should not be about defending, Wittgenstein says, an abstract position in thought. It depends on a certain point of view, Luke, but rather unlocking genius and being fruitful in thought. It is not about defending a certain castle of objective truth. And the human nature, both said, people who like objective truth out in the world or in the mind, they tend to battle as if they alone have it. They need to get rid of their competitors. So we can enable imagination with this uh, no number of three objects on a table and set arrangements. And if that's a table, that's certainly all the ways apples mean things in life as a very easygoing thing to handle. Apples, anyway, compared to other things like sex, violence, and everything else important on the weekends. So, truth and meaning are in the world and in the mind, and our minds are in the world, along with countless other meaningful and useful things. I really do think thinking about our minds and our emotions as if they're objects in the world, as much as some may find that brute or behaviorist or possibly disturbing, I really think there's genuine humanism and understanding that we refer to others' emotions as objects, not emotionless objects, like living things. Very much all like spirits. And we talk about things, people's anger, calm, all sorts of things. And we really are negotiating about that if we pay attention to how we negotiate so much about our desires, others' desires, and desiring about desires and feeling about feelings. As Wittgenstein said, the point of philosophy is not to spare others the trouble of thinking, 
And these are wonderful guiding words, I must say. But to help others stimulate new thoughts of their own by showing them all the situations they're in. I do believe that as a teacher of philosophy. My job is not to convince you to believe me. My job is to show you the situation and how there's 15 things you could think here. That's my job, and I don't care. You know, if you want to Peter Pan off this dam and take 14 more of them, it's like, okay, fine. You know, I do care again. I want you to live and be happy. Again, we all need to be happy. Forms of life, happy trees. But again, um, as this is actually one of the final wrapping up uh, lectures for logic and uh, for modern philosophy, I am going to continue to make videos about all of these things and detail more. I plan to. But as a final lecture of some of the philosophy I find most important in life, I must say, when you are engaging with other people, you don't really need to, as Nietzsche said, defend truth as if she needs you to defend it and she is so helpless, oh no, oh no's. And so why does truth need you uh, need defenders if truth is so strong and so noble? That's truth, meaning, the mind, all of this are simple, everyday, stupid things we use. And the more we see that, the more that we should be about encouraging and others to see things simply and, and in all the ways we wish, rather than try to force people into very particular positions. But of course, this is the mind and the world as you know them. So yeah, good night, everybody, on that, you know. So anyway, I do believe overall in accepting the species we have and that the species we are and we have has been very human for a very long time. So much life, many forms of life, and much love, especially if you're expecting them. And again, I will see here or think of you if again, ever any of that, and if I ever do see you.